The peace of the Lord be with you. And good morning and welcome to everyone. Um, my apologies, I, the kids brought me a cold, so I, uh, that's why I'm, I've been wearing the mask and that sort of thing. We are, we are going to have the elders do the distribution. I won't, I won't do the distribution itself because of that. Uh, we know it's not COVID, though. They were tested. I'm vaccinated, so we, we <laughs> rest assured it's not, it's not COVID. But, uh, but lest I, I share with something with you that you'd rather I not share with you, I want to be cautious about that. Um, we do have a couple of announcements before we begin. Uh, first of all, uh, I am starting vacation tomorrow, so I won't be here next week. Pastor Hanson will be here. So um, if he preaches anything wrong, let me know, and then I can get in touch with him after the fact. So uh, no, but I'll, be, I'll be back uh, Wednesday of that week. So, um, so yeah, if, if, while I'm gone, we'll make sure if, if there are any pastoral needs that we, we get those taken care of. Um, other announcements. Uh, I've been uh, announcing it, but I want to remind you one more time. We are planning on having the memorial service for Liz Godis on, on the 24th, on July 24th at 1 p.m. If you're planning on going, please let me know or let Terry know, uh, especially by the, if you could by, by Wednesday. We want to let, give the family kind of an estimated number of how many people we'll be having from the congregation so they can kind of do some planning on for their part. So, uh, and in, in addition to that, then on the uh, 25th, the, not this, the, the Sunday that I come back, um, but the first Sunday after I'm, I'm gone next week, um, we will be starting to have the collection plate again, where we pass the collection plate. So uh, I just we just wanted to give people a heads up, and uh, you know, obviously, if you don't want to, to handle the plate or whatnot, we can you know the, we'll have it available so that you can always still put the envelope in it. But uh, we are planning on doing the offering during the, the service itself. So um, other than that, as always, I point you to the communion statement in the front of the bulletin. Due to the unfortunate differences between Christians, we do practice close communion. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 916, Only Begotten, Word of God Eternal, and we will sing that after the pealing of the bells.
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the earth. In them He has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. It's rising from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The just decrees of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord of all power and might, author and giver of all good things, graft into our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and of your great mercy keep us in the same. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for this, the sixth Sunday after Trinity, is from the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the, to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from Paul's letter to the Romans, the sixth chapter. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for our Lord's words of the Holy Ghost. St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all the worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten of my being, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he was again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge the baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we meditate on the Gospel lesson which was previously read. Please be seated. Well, as Lutherans, I'm guessing you all know those beloved verses of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. If you don't know the reference, I'm guessing you at least know the words. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not by works that no one may boast. That's the heart of our message, isn't it? As, as Lutherans, as Christians altogether, but especially as Lutherans, that you can't get to heaven by being good enough, be and so you are saved by God's grace. Or another way to say it is that your sin is too much for you to overcome, so even your good works don't earn God's favor toward you, and therefore God sent Jesus to die for your sins. And so you go to heaven not by trusting in your own works, but in trusting what Christ has done for you. In light of that then, what's the accusation that people always make when they hear that gospel message? Have you heard, have you heard that accusation? I'm guessing you probably have. Well, if you don't earn your way to heaven, then you can tell people to do whatever they want and they can still get there. Or you can do whatever you want and still get there. That's, that's horrible. Or if you put it another way, people will say, well, if you can tell people that they can't and won't earn their way to heaven, then you're just encouraging them to sin. Is that true? Do I get up in this pulpit every week and encourage you to sin because I tell you week in and week out that Christ has died for your sins? Or as Paul put it in the epistle lesson, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? That's the human logic here, isn't it? In fact, I remember having a conversation with a friend once and he was going on this, this long monologue that was a joke about how he's decided that since you know, Christ has died for the sins of every man, woman, and child ever, that, that he should sin all the more and, as he put it, maximize the grace efficiency. Now, he was obviously kidding. But that's kind of the logic that people assume, isn't it? 
Isn't, isn't that how we think as people? You know, that, that if, I, if I'm guaranteed a benefit from X, then I should maximize that benefit. You know, if someone was willing to give me money, then I should maximize the benefit of how much money they'll give me. Of course, as I put it in those terms, I think we recognize how that tends to fall short in an earthly context. But our sinful brains tend to make that connection then to assume that that's how it works before God, too, isn't it? As I say that, though, as I keep asking if this is true, I'm expecting that in your head you're saying, no, Pastor, that's not how it works. We don't just keep on sinning to maximize the benefit of God's grace. Or as Paul says to answer that question, should we continue sinning that grace may abound? May ganoito. May it not be. But then why do we continue to act? And so that's what we're trying to do. Why do we continue to sin? Why do we continue to live as though, since we're saved by grace, it doesn't matter? Well, from a theological perspective, thank you. You know the answer. It's easy. It's because we're still sinners. Thank you. Have all heard me say that? That Latin phrase, simul justus et peccator, and I'm going to test you guys on that next week. You know, simultaneously justified and sinner. Probably you've heard that. As I say that, though, that can, can sound overly simple. Well, yeah, we're still sinners, so what? But it's true. Right? Just after this passage that, Paul, that we have here from Paul in Romans chapter 6, he has this whole discussion about God's commands and God's law and, 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 and its relationship to the Christian. And he, he says things in there about how, how we're held captive to the law, held captive to those commands. That these, these commands and these, this law, that they, they keep us captive to sin and to death. He even goes on to say that, that the commands themselves arouse a sinful desire in him. This is what my pastor that confirm, confirmed me always called, a, called cookie jar theology. Right? You know, if you're making cookies at home and you have the little kids there, you, know, you can make the cookies, put them in the jar, and put the jar in the fridge, and kids might not think that much about it. But if you make the cookies, put them in the jar and they see you put the jar in the fridge and you say, I've got cookies in there, don't eat them. Where do the kids' brains go? How can I get those cookies? Right? That's what the law does. It provokes sinful desires in us. So then, are, are the commands bad? Is the problem with the law? No. Paul says the law is good. It's righteous. So what's the problem then? Us. Right? The problem is in our sinful hearts. We are the problem. Our sinful nature is the problem. It's in light of that then that we see what Jesus tells us about the law. He says, whoever relaxes the, one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he says that you have to hear the law to its fullest extent. And he explains what that looks like right after this verse. You know, he uses the example of murder. He connects this to what the, what the rabbis and the teachers at the time taught, that they would say, well, if anyone murders, he's liable to judgment. But what did Jesus go on to say? He makes the point that it isn't just about the action of taking away someone's breath and causing their heart to stop beating, right? No, he says, even if you call your neighbor raka, fool, you're liable to hell. And why does Jesus say that? Because your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees if you want to get to heaven. He's saying, look, Look at the best person you know. If you want to get to heaven, you have to be better than that. And what's he really saying when he says that? Well, what he's really saying is that when God gives these commands, and these commands are good, right? These commands that you heard in the Old Testament lesson, those are, are good commands, the Ten Commandments. He says when you hear those, you better be trying to do them. 
In fact, you better be trying to keep them to the fullest extent. If not, your righteousness has failed. But what's the point of that? Your righteousness has failed. It's failed, and you're liable to hell for it. That's what the law brings. That's the, the promise of the law. The, the law has a promise, right? If you, the law says, do this and you will live. And so if you keep those commandments, yeah, you'll live. But as I always say, what's the problem with that? We don't do it. And we know this because what's the mortality rate of people in this room going to be? Ultimately, 100%, right? The wages of sin is death. We're bound to it. We can't help it. It's like a prison for us. To come back to, to Paul again, he even acknowledges that problem in Romans chapter 7, right after this. He talks about wanting to do good. And I, I love this passage in Romans 7. It's one of my favorites. You know, one of my 8,000 favorites, but one of my favorites. He says, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. In other words, he says, I'm, you know, I'm trying to do the right thing, but I keep messing it up. And maybe you can identify with that. Hopefully, you can identify with that. You know, hopefully, I'm, I'm telling you to keep these commandments, and you say, Pastor, I'm trying, but I keep messing it up. Or maybe you're thinking, Pastor, I know I should try better to keep the commandments. You know, but hopefully you're not thinking, but Pastor, we're just human. I mean, as true as it is that we as fallen humans can't keep the law, and that's absolutely true, that's not our justification. Right? The, the, we don't just make that excuse. The commands come and tell us, they might tell us, yeah, you're right, you can't keep these, but that doesn't excuse you from not keeping them. You know, yeah, it's true that you can't do it, but my call doesn't let me stand up here and loosen the law for you and just say, well, by golly, that's okay if you don't. But I can tell you exactly what Paul says to finish that thought that he just had about not being able to do the good that he wants to do and doing the evil that he doesn't want to do. Do you know how he finishes that thought? Hopefully you do. I think you do, not maybe word for word. But as I say that, word for word, what he says is this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death. In other words, you are not condemned by the law because of Jesus. You have freedom from that law because Jesus has set you free. As I say that, though, about having freedom from that law, I think it's good for us to understand what that means. I was, excuse me, I was actually reading about uh, Luther's preface to the, to the letter to the Romans. I don't know if you knew that. I think it was about 1535 or so, uh, Luther finished these, these prefaces to each of the books in the, in the Bible, particularly the New Testament. And his, his, his preface to the letter of the Romans is actually relatively well known. You've maybe heard something from that before, because in that he talks about this relationship between faith and good works. And one of the things that he makes the point about is that faith spontaneously does these good works. You, like I said, you maybe have heard that, that passage before. It's actually the passage that converted uh, Charles Wesley, that you know, started the Methodist Church. Um, but So it's, it's really good stuff. But he also says something else that's great. And that's what I want to read to you here. He, he makes this connection between that freedom from the law, and as Paul put it here, this law, the freedom from the law of sin and death. What Luther says is, to be without the law is not the same thing as to have no laws and to be able to do what one pleases. I'm going to, I'm going to say that again because I think that's good for us to, to recognize, especially in our time. To be without the law, to be free from the law, is not the same thing as to have no laws and to be able to do what one pleases. He continues, though, saying, we, Rather, we are under the law when without grace we occupy ourselves with the works of the law. And what he means by that is we occupy ourselves with keeping the law so that we can get to heaven. He says, At that point, then, certain, sin certainly rules us through the law. For no one loves the law by nature, and that is great sin. Grace, however, makes the law dear to us. Then sin is no longer present, and the law is no longer against us, but one with us. 
And what does that, what's he mean by that? Well, in other words, what he's saying is that when we are in Christ, we can actually love God's law. We can actually love these commands that he gives us. Now, as I said, you might think, well, but don't, there are people that aren't Christian that like to do those things, right? I mean, it's true. Even without Christ, we can like to not murder someone. We can like to not steal, right? But the reality is that, that we don't do this by nature. The reality is that, that we maybe don't, don't like to not kill people. Or we, where, you know, we like to not kill people because it makes us feel bad if we harm them. Or we like to not steal because it makes us feel good that we're protecting our neighbor's possessions. Right? So there's something, something about it. Either we don't want to feel that guilt or we like the way we feel when we do it. We don't naturally like the law. But then when it comes to actually hearing the fullest extent of the law, you know, when Jesus comes and he tells us that we all deserve hell, every, everybody from the, the unborn child to the sweetest old lady, when we hear the fullest extent of that, we don't like it. What do we say then? It's unfair. It's unjust. It's too demanding. Who could be saved? And that's where Jesus comes in, though, and he says what he says in the gospel lesson. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus didn't come to throw these commands out. Instead, he came that they wouldn't be a burden that we would have to carry. He came to carry the burden of the cross that we couldn't perfectly. He came to be crucified for them, being raised again, that we would have that forgiveness. That's, and that's why I'm always harping about being in church week in and week out. Because that is where this life of forgiveness comes to us. Life, forgiveness, salvation, fulfillment of that law are in Christ. And this is where He gives that to us. Here is where He speaks those sins forgiven in our ears. Fulfillment in our ears. Here is where He feeds us with that perfected law for us. And here is where He baptized into that death, baptized us into that death that we could be raised in His resurrection. This helps us to understand then this connection between that forgiveness of sins and the faith that lives that out. In fact, I think baptism in particular shows us how we could understand that, especially as Paul talks about it in the epistle lesson. Listen to what he says one more time. He says in baptism, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. For the death Christ died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You are alive to God in Christ Jesus. So you love God's commands. Love them. Do them. Keep them. Do so because they aren't what gets you to heaven. No, Jesus takes care of that. Because He came not to abolish, but fulfill. And in that fulfillment, you truly are saved by grace through faith, not by works, so that no one can boast, but so that you can be God's workmanship, made anew in Christ Jesus, doing what He has given for you to do. Amen. And may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in that faith in Christ Jesus and to new life in Him and life everlasting. Amen. Please rise for prayer. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Oh Lord, you gave the law that we might know your will and live as your holy people. 
Increase in us true fear, love, and trust in your saving word and your holy name, that we may love your law and seek always to be faithful to you in the life that is ours in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed Lord, you give the command to honor mother and father, establishing the home as the center for our society. Guide and bless all fathers and mothers, pastors and teachers as they bring up children in the discipline and knowledge of the true faith. Be with our homes and bless them. Be especially with Robert Coulot, May Harris, Judy Latman, Lois Flood, Noel Sheldon, Ruth and Jim Reed, and Sue and Tony Napolitano, as well as all of those celebrating your good gifts of birthdays, anniversaries, and other joyous occasions. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, you gave the commandments to us that we might live a holy life and love our neighbors as ourselves. Give us your Holy Spirit and teach us to honor authority, protect life, cherish cherish marriage, respect possessions, defend reputations, and be content with the gifts you give us. Bless also our nation with your wisdom that we would all go about this work faithfully. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, giver of all that is good, grant your healing and support to all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity, hunger or homelessness, unemployment or underemployment. Be especially with all those listed in our bulletin, Leslie, Peggy, Ann, Jennifer, Nancy and Kent, Jerry, Tia and her unborn child, Isaac, Richard, Blake, John, Shirley, Sarah, Tim, Richard, John, Phyllis, Christine, Lori, Cassie, Joanne, Jack, Doris, Lynn, Renee, the Cooey family, Mary Jane, Eleanor, Kulaga, and family, Jack, Steve, Gail, Sonny, Bruce, Rod, Deborah, Lisa, Kathy, Dorothy, Joyce, Levi, Leah, Jurgen, Kurt, Adam, Kimmy, Sharon, Sharon, Judy and Kurt, Don and Gail, Megan and her unborn child, Ted, Noah, Jennifer, Zachary, Mike, and Nancy. Give all of them the gift of your grace, Uh, to accept and bear their crosses with faith in you, that finally they would be prepared to depart this life and receive the gift of eternal life in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood, you forgive our sins and bind us together in your communion of love. Grant that we may also gladly forgive the sins of our brothers and let no division arise among us gathered at your table. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in holy baptism, You join your children to the death and resurrection of your Son. Bless the memory of all of our loved ones who have departed in the faith, and comfort all who mourn with the knowledge that being united with Christ in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of Him who died and rose again, and who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated as we continue with the preparation of the sacrament of the altar. Please rise as we continue with the service of the sacrament found beginning on page 9 of the bulletin. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Be with them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabbath. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve, who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross, and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Now this is the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to strengthen and preserve you in body and soul, and the one true saving faith to life everlasting, depart in peace. We continue with the new commitment this time, page 12. Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you, and from in love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Our closing hymn is hymn 587, I Know My Faith is Found in hymn 587. 